previously on ISOM. I demand respect, so respect me! 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 Well, the second issue of ISOM is here, folks. After I waited three weeks for my pre-order to arrive from the announced shipping date, it finally ended up in my hands. Now, after delays caused by tech issues, the illness that shall not be named, and my work schedule suddenly changing to being very busy, I can finally let you know my thoughts on if Eric July's latest attempt at writing is any better than the last time he tried telling a, uh, story. There's no way it could get any worse, right? I'm Jess Zilla, and this is my moronic opinion on ISOM number 2. Psalm number two comes to us from Ripiverse Publishing. It was written by Eric July with pencils and inks by Cliff Richards, with colors by Gabe El Taib, and lettering by Eric Weathers. This is the second part of three in the ill-advised story arc. The story starts the day after two weeks ago in Flores Park, Texas. We open with Altona in an elevator having a meaningless chat with a co-worker about how she seems nervous. She then enters her very secure office to find Darren, the local mob boss. Darren is there because he believes Altona put her brother Avery, also known as the superhero I saw, up to confronting him over her missing friend, Jasmine Newman, in the previous issue. Darren wants to know how Avery defeated his superhuman guard, Santuan, the night before and thinks Altona knows the answers. So Darren beats Altona and threatens her daughter, Vassi, in an attempt to get those answers. Altona's boss, Lincoln Usbio, breaks into the office with his security to save Altona. Lincoln and Darren exchange threats with each other before Darren gets one in the gut. This is somebody getting gut punched in an ISOM comic. I just feel like it's missing something. There we go. Now it's perfect. Darren is escorted out and claims that this is not over. Lincoln tells Altona that he will protect both her and Vassie. On the next page, there is a sudden flashback to years before two weeks ago in a wrecked convention center. We see two congoers cowering in cover when our boy Avery appears to escort them to safety. The villainous Chad Run suddenly appears and Avery fights him to buy time for the congoers to escape. During the brawl, Chad Run ends up grabbing the lady congoer and crushes her head in front of Avery. This solves the mystery as to why Avery left the heroic life behind. We then cut back to the day after two weeks ago where we see Avery telling his story to Cedric, the tailor to the superheroes. While relaying this story, Avery talks about the unfair assumptions that the public has about superheroes always having a situation under control, and how many superheroes don't know how to handle a loss because the good guys are always expected to win. Personally, I don't understand why Avery was so torn up about this. The dead girl was obviously a fake nerd anyways, so no big loss! Avery then goes back home to his ranch where he finds the door that Sam, the lead ranch hand, went through in the previous issue. After entering the open door, Avery encounters these demon fellas, who look like they come from the crossroads of Hell and the Planet of the Apes. After a brief scuffle, the monkey demons self-destruct for some reason, which then causes the building to burst into flames. Some of Avery's employees then come on the scene and tend to his wound. One of them mentions that they have already called for help for the blaze, but that doesn't stop this cowboy fellow from drawing his six-shooter when that help arrives. The employees are unaware of the location of Sam, and Avery says he doesn't think Sam was in the burning building. Gooding, a superhero for hire, shows up on the scene to stop the fire. A superhero for hire. What an original idea! And what's with the misspelling of Gooding's name on this page? We then cut to a brief scene of Alpha Core having a discussion about their encounter with the superhuman Yaira the previous day. Back on the ranch, Avery gives Gooding the 411 of what happened, and Gooding offers his investigative services for a price. Avery goes home and crashes, but his rest is interrupted by a call from Altona and Lincoln, who tell Avery of Darren's visit. Lincoln assures Avery that Altona and her daughter are both being protected, but nonetheless, Avery is very put off by this. Meanwhile, back at Club Merc and what should be the main plot of this story, Darren monologues to his goons about how he plans to deal with Lincoln and how he hopes that what he did that morning will flush Avery out for elimination. Santuan then arrives and Darren questions him about how Avery defeated him so easily the previous night. Santuan refuses to answer, so Darren fires him. 
Darren then chooses to focus on his illegitimate operations and calls for Jasmine to be brought to him. We then cut to a wrestling match for some reason, before cutting to Lincoln turning off the match on TV so he and his assistant can go down to a parking garage to meet up with Sally, who is definitely not at all the alter ego of Yaira. They speak briefly about some boring corpo crap before Sally leaves. Lincoln and his assistant then leave the garage when some of Darren's goons pull up for a drive-by. This assassination attempt fails due to the armor plating of the car that Lincoln is in. Lincoln tells his assistant that he knows that he is a mole for Darren and takes control of the car, smashing it into a barrier. Back on the ranch, Avery arms himself in a scene that feels like it's trying to be John Wick. Mrs. Willard, the wife of the missing Sam, appears at Avery's house and tells him that Sam never came home the previous night. Avery invites her to go with him to Gooding's headquarters. When they arrive, Avery informs Mrs. Willard of the fire and how nobody had seen Sam since the previous night. Mrs. Willard is so shocked by this that she faints. One of Gooding's robot assistants tends to her. Avery then describes to Gooding the monsters he saw earlier. Gooding says that he found a molecule in a sample of Avery's blood taken from the fire that belongs to a creature not of this world. A alien from outside space! Interdimensional beings, actually, and Sam could very well be in their place of origin. Gooding then refers Avery to someone better suited to deal with the matter. The next evening, Avery suits up as I saw him and learns from a recording from Cedric about the upgrades to his suit. Oh, dude, four strength, four stam leather belt, level 18. Ah! Uh, uh, uh. Avery then sets out to meet the referral at their castle in the middle of the vast Texas wasteland. After a brief tussle with a few guardian animals and a dragon, their master, Sidney Bloodruth, shows herself. Bloodruth is apparently a witch, and Avery informs her of everything that has happened to him. Bloodruth tells Avery that the monsters he saw are interdimensional beings, something we have already been informed of, and that she recently eliminated one near a cave 50 miles away. The pair then head for the cave. When they arrive, Avery rushes in hot-headed and without a plan. Avery and Bloodruth then fight their way through a seemingly endless horde of monsters. The pair eventually spot what looks like a cage, and Bloodruth makes a go for it. Bloodruth then uses her magical abilities to blow the door, which now looks much smaller and much more solid than it did a few moments ago. Bloodruth enters the entrance she just created to find a bunch of dead bodies and the still alive Sam. The pair then make a run for it, and as they flee, we see that Sam has been cursed or something. Bloodruth and Sam manage to escape on her dragon, while her other familial creatures and Avery cover them. Avery is left unable to escape, and is then faced with the final boss monster. To my own surprise, I actually have a few good things to say about this book. The main story that I saw number two chooses to follow ends up actually fitting the proper plot structure, unlike its predecessor. Maybe Eric July actually did some reading up on how to structure a story before writing the second issue. Whether he did or not, I do commend him for getting it right this time. The exposition is when Avery enters the security building on his ranch and gets attacked by the two monkey demons, followed by the building catching on fire. The rising action is when Gooding shows up and puts out the fire. Avery goes home and is spoken to by Sam's wife. The pair going to speak to Gooding, who directs Avery to Bloodruth, who Avery also goes to speak with. The pair goes to the demon lair, fights the demons, and rescues Sam. The climax is when Avery chooses to cover Bloodruth and Sam's escape. The falling action is Avery being left behind and his fighting off the demons. And the resolution is when the King Monkey Demon makes his appearance. Other positive things include this fake ad and the issue for Gooding Services because it seems to be a fun way to introduce the character. My only problem with it is that I feel like it should have been placed towards the beginning of the book and treated like a real ad because its current placement stops the story in its tracks. I also appreciate that this time around that the sole advertisement in this book is reserved for the inside of the very back cover. That's all I have to say about that. When it comes to the art, it feels like Cliff Richards phoned it in this time around. There's a lot of the same passable but bland moments that we saw in the first issue, but we also get a lot of moments like this. I found these panels of Avery pretty laughable. The action sequences in this story come across to me as slow and unexciting. Taking a real quick digression to cover A for a moment, while I really don't care how Avery looks on this cover, I actually kind of like how Chad Run looks here. His look here reminds me of a 90s era image character. However, when we see him in the story, Richards has Chad Run looking more like a bland manlet of a monster. During Avery's fight scene with Chad Run, we have this panel here. What, what exactly is Avery doing? Is he wincing and holding his knuckles in pain, or is he cracking his knuckles before striking another blow? 
In the latter part of the book, when Avery suits up again, the look on Avery's face seems to be one more of fear than determination. It would be nice if Richards was more clear about what emotions Avery was trying to show. Just take a moment to look at old Sant one here. If you ask me, he looks pretty off-model from the neck up in his appearance in this issue compared to the first one. Look on the mask of my boy. His head just looks like a blob on his shoulders. This moment right here with Blood Ruth. There is no perception of depth in this panel. I know she is supposed to be uphill looking downhill, but the way she is drawn here just makes it look like she is 50 feet tall. We get this moment shortly after. I understand that Blood Ruth is drained from using her powers, but these panels make it look like she's trying to gingerly make it to the toilet before she soils herself. When it comes to the coloring, Eisner award-winning colorist Gabe El Taib makes the same continuity error he made in his first issue. When Mrs. Willard shows up on Avery's doorstep, it's dusk. When the pair arrives at Gooding's base, it's a blue-skied sunny day. Then it is dusk again on the following page. Like its predecessor, this book wins the Plan 9 from Outer Space Continuity Award. Now to move on to the real nitty-gritty. Getting into the story, which I have no doubt was yet another first draft script like its predecessor, I saw number 2 is 112 pages long with 108 pages of story. If you remember my last video, the average monthly comic issue is 32 pages with 22 pages of story, and story arcs normally last 4 to 6 issues. That makes them 88 to 132 pages of story per arc. I'm going to make a quick correction from my review for my Psalm number 1 here. I mistakenly stated that a 4 issue comic arc was 84 pages long rather than 88. I totally fail at basic math. I Psalm number 1 had 83 pages of story. When combined with number 2, we now have 191 pages of story. The ill-advised story arc is one page away from being 60 pages longer than the average six-issue story arc, and only one of the plot lines introduced over either of the issues has been resolved. And the way that one is handled is pretty sloppy if you ask me. More on that in a bit. The main plot that was introduced back in issue number one and set up as the main story for the story arc is sidelined into being a B-plot, to focus on one of the subplots introduced in the previous issue. The previous MacGuffin, which is a character or object that is the driving force of a story, from ISOM number 1 has been abandoned for the new MacGuffin of Sam. This shouldn't be surprising since Eric July previously abandoned the MacGuffin of Jasmine in the first issue, 11 pages after it was introduced so our main character could go on a crybaby rampage. The feud introduced in the first issue between Avery and Darren has changed to being between Darren and Lincoln, who apparently have a pre-existing rivalry with one another. Out of 108 story pages, only 20 pages of this issue are in any way connected to the main plot from the previous issue, while 66 pages are focused on the new main plot of this arc. This series is only two issues in, and it's gone from a former superhero reluctantly looking for a missing family friend to Avery fighting interdimensional monkeys in a hell cave. The first story arc isn't even complete, and this series has already jumped the shark. The main plot this issue chooses to follow feels like it should have been more the second story arc of the series. Like its predecessor, ISOM number 2 feels too busy and unfocused with all the subplots that it introduces or continues from the first story. This is no doubt an attempt to force world building, but most of these scenes just don't really go anywhere. Just pick a single main plot for your story arc and stick to it. A B-plot can also be worked in if its resolution somehow plays a role with the climax and resolution of the A-plot. Having all of this for a single story arc is story overload, especially when things that have been introduced in Isom number 1 have been unceremoniously dropped to introduce new subplots. I have no doubt at all that the subplots introduced in this issue won't even be referenced in Isom number 3 in favor of introducing even more subplots. Again, like its predecessor, the story has pacing issues and many scenes that can be removed. Have you ever seen a bad movie where every scene feels like it just drags on for way too long, which can cause a 90 minute runtime to feel double that? Well, this here is the comic book equivalent. I had a lot of trouble keeping focus reading this because the story is boring and exposition heavy. It just kept dragging on and on and on and on. For me, this was the story's main problem. This time around, I'm going to make the pacing issues the primary focus of my review. And I'm also going to make a few suggestions of how the pacing issues can be fixed, while also making a digression here and there to talk about other issues this book has. Starting with the opening scene with Altona, we have this panel here where she already looks worried. Comics are a visual medium, so it's very easy to get a point across just by showing us an image and not saying anything. 
We don't need this meaningless corporate speak conversation with her co-worker to once again establish that something might be bothering Altona. After a little rearranging and getting rid of the conversation, we are left with this single page here which gets the same point across much faster. Now on to the single resolve plotline I spoke of a moment ago. As advertised on cover A, this story tells us the reason Avery left Super Heroics behind. I was honestly shocked that we were already getting this story when the pre-order campaign for Islam Number 2 was announced. I figured that this would be a story we wouldn't get until AFTER the storyline with Jasmine and Darren was resolved. I also thought it might involve these green guys we saw on this page from Isom Number 1, and also have an appearance on the cover of that book. You know, a teaser hidden in plain sight type of thing. Isom Number 2 introduced and gets this storyline out of the way pretty quickly. We have a six page opening scene, and then we jump to a flashback giving us the reason why Avery quit. Eric July served this right up on a silver platter with no setup or anything intriguing leading up to it. Do you folks remember what I said about Eric Powell's The Goon in my review for Isom Number 1? It was years before we learned the reason why the goon is such a jaded character, and we got hints to what happened to him along the way in order to build up interest in that mystery. That is the correct way to handle a character with a mysterious past. A common complaint I've seen among the Rip clan when anyone dares to speak ill of Isom and gives a solid reason why they believe it is a bad story has been, Uh, you just want your hand held because you can't handle a complex story. Along with other such nonsense. The reveal of Avery's past defeat is what holding an audience's hand looks like. It's just something that's sprung on us from out of nowhere. And what little time we've had with Avery, we've been given no reason to believe he was feeling any guilt or had any sense of failure over that poor woman's death until it is revealed that he was telling the story to Cedric. It would make more sense from a narrative standpoint if the flashback scene was how the first issue opened. If it would have been done this way, it would have given us a clear reason as to why Avery was so reluctant to help find Jasmine because he is afraid of failing, rather than us being left in the dark and believing that Avery is just a jerk overly obsessed with people respecting him. This plot point of Avery feeling like a failure is introduced and resolved in this 10 page sequence. The resolution to this is Cedric simply telling Avery, eh, it happens, get over it and don't quit again. I was also left wondering after the flashback in it if that's all we're going to see of this event, or if Eric July is establishing yet another subplot. I have no doubt at all that Chad Run will make another appearance in the future, but I highly doubt it will be in a continuation of this flashback. After his talk with Cedric, Avery goes back home to his ranch. To me, this doesn't really make much sense. It was established in the previous story that Avery has a vendetta against Darren he wants to settle. Avery retrieves his super suit for reasons unknown, a move that's motivation should have been revealed in Isom number 1 as the climactic moment that I figured would probably be established in this story. And then he just goes back home? Why? What? What? What's the reason for this? It makes Avery deciding to become Isom again make even less sense. Especially later on, when the phone call Avery gets from Altona makes it seem as though Avery had no intention in returning to Flores Park or dealing with the situation with Darren any further. I guess in this moment from my Psalm number one, Avery was talking about being done with the whole Darren situation entirely and not just the search for Jasmine. I guess Avery's reason for putting on his super suit again was because this series is supposed to be a superhero adventure. So Eric July just decided to write a scene where Avery puts his tights back on. End story motivation for any of this, be damned. Now back to Avery going home in the following scene. For starters, we don't need a full page sequence of Avery leaving Floors Park and driving back home. This page right here, when he enters the security building, we don't need these panels of him trying to turn on the lights or swatting at flies. Just show Avery walking in through the open door and seeing the glowing eyes. When Avery has his first encounter with the demons, the scene can be altered to where most of the fight is removed and Avery is just throwing a single punch that one of the demons stops, followed by the demon attacking Avery. Doing it this way makes the scene feel more dramatic, creates tension, and also makes the villains look like a greater threat than before when Avery managed to knock one of them across the room. This panel of Avery grabbing his shoulder in pain is not needed. The previous panel makes it pretty obvious that he's been injured. The monster's teleporting or self-destruct or whatever it is can be trimmed from a whole page to just three panels. And just like before with some additional alterations, here's the streamlined version of this scene. Five pages trimmed down to three. The single scene that features Alpha Core could have been omitted because it stops the main plot that this issue follows in its tracks. But since we're here anyway, I'll go ahead and get my thoughts on this scene out of the way. We have Brian. The leader, saying Yaira gave him a tough fight when he first encountered her in events that took place before I saw him number one. Valda says that she doesn't feel that Yaira is a threat because Brian gave Yaira an ultimatum to disappear rather than taking her in. 
Brian's response to that is that Yair is a threat, but just not a threat to Alpha Core. This is a paradox because Brian just stated that Yara gave him a hard time when they first met and fought. If you ask me, somebody that you say you had trouble fighting sounds like a threat. On to the next scene of Avery at home. Half the panels on this page can be removed. You can still have the establishing panel showing that he's at his house, but we don't need to see him walking to his couch. It could have just cut from outside to Avery sitting down and the internalizing from the now removed panel can be placed in this panel. Also. Why were the ISOM style internalizing boxes changed here? That's definitely a nitpick on my part, but for consistency, let's give that a fix as well. Was I the only one who thought that this was supposed to be the second bit of dialogue for this panel, and there was just a bit of missing dialogue at the start of this moment? The following panel can be removed, and its dialogue can be added to the previous panel, and then cut to this third panel of a shocked Avery rising up. Removing the panel between these makes the moment come across in a more dynamic manner. On the next page, showing Avery hanging up the phone after his talk with Altona can be removed. There would have been a better dramatic impact if Altona would have mentioned to Lincoln that Avery had hung up on them, and then the next page was just a full page splash of Avery raging. And that's it for this scene. Four pages trimmed down to three. This scene in Club Merc, when Santuan walks in and does this tough guy act when he's called for. My first thought was, Darren signs your paychecks, jackass. Of course he can and will summon you whenever he needs you, or just feels like it. That's how being an employee works. It just makes no sense to me that Santuan wouldn't want to give Darren all the information he knows about Avery. You would think that Santuan's humiliating defeat would make him eager to spill everything he knows about their mutual foe. Especially since ISOM number 1 established that Santuan knows who Avery is, and that the pair would plot together the best way to destroy Avery. I also think it's pretty funny that despite Darren's calling of Santuan to dress him down, that they take a moment in the beginning to politely shake hands with one another. The scene is also the only time in ISOM number 2 that Jasmine, the MacGuffin for this entire story arc, is even mentioned. The scene of the wrestling match is another scene that can be completely done away with. It serves no point and just interrupts the flow of the plot that is already interrupting the plot that was previously established in ISOM number 1 as the main story of this arc. But if this scene is to be kept, here's what can be changed. First, get rid of this page. I've never seen a full page splash that focuses on an empty doorway before, making this probably the dullest splash page I have ever seen. On the next two pages, we have a full page of the wrestler, Larry Shungite, walking to the ring, and then two panels of him waiting for a mic to lower from the rafters so he can cut a promo. He could have just been shown walking to the ring, grabbing the mic, and starting to talk to the audience all in a single page. Once again, while I believe this scene can be removed altogether, I have still taken the time to take it from six pages down to four. I'm sure that this is just a setup for yet another subplot for the future, or this is just a setup for Larry Shungite to have his own series. Either way, I doubt we'll see any more of this in ISOM number 3, just like how we saw nothing of Copper and Renashi or Norfrica in this issue. Maybe this scene only exists as filler pages to show what Lincoln was watching on TV. I will give Eric July this. At least he was paying off something he set up in the previous issue when this wrestling promotion was first mentioned by Cedric. Too bad it is just a waste of time and kills the already slow pacing of this book. The scene right here in the parking garage where Lincoln talks to Sally can be removed because all this scene contains is more boring corporate speak that has nothing to do with any of the stories that have appeared in this arc. But at least we got to see Yaira again. Right guys? You guys remember Yaira? The story could have just jumped from the scene with Darren to Lincoln in his car being attacked. Speaking of the scene, why does Lincoln smash his car into a barrier launching himself out the windshield? Is... Darren can't kill me if I do it to myself first, the logic that Lincoln is operating under. We then move on to Avery arming himself and preparing to go somewhere, possibly back to Flores Park to deal with Darren, when he's stopped by Sam's wife about the whereabouts of her husband. This scene left me with the question, why hadn't Avery already spoken to Mrs. Willard about her husband? You'd think that after the fire and everybody wondering where Sam is, Avery would have tried contacting him. There have been times I've accidentally overslept and been a no-call, no-show to work. On those rare occasions, my employers have always called to see where I was. Avery just left this poor woman in the dark all day that her husband was missing. Why did Avery wait until they got to Gooding's base before telling Miss Willard anything? At this point, fainting is not the proper reaction to this news. Mrs. Willard giving Avery a smack across his face for keeping this information secret from her for the sake of providing drama would be what a good writer would do in this scene. Let me digress really quick back to the page of Avery prepping to go out. What was the point of this if it's immediately derailed? This moment can be removed, and right after Avery's phone call with Altona, he could just have a knock at his door, and it's Mrs. Willard, and the two could head for Gooding's base after a brief discussion about Sam. After this, we can have the scene at Club Merc and the car chase with Lincoln. 
Then we can pick back up with Avery and Mrs. Willard arriving at Goodings. Speaking of the scene at Goodings, there is this page that is an exposition dump involving world building, but it feels like the info we are being given are things that we should already be familiar with. Judging by some of the info in the DLC for this series, the Dokumon cards, mentioning one of the events Avery and Gooding talk about, I'm guessing it is expected by Eric July for the reader to already be a little familiar with the info on the cards. This moment, and having a similar incident in ISOM number 1 with the Dokumon cards, makes parts of this series feel very inside baseball. This page continues on talking about similar creatures being spotted during the previously mentioned war and their possible connection to an earthquake for some reason before Avery gets referred to Blood Ruth. This four-page exposition dump can be cut down to These creatures are not of this earth and possibly interdimensional in origin. It is beyond my ability to help you with this, but I know someone who can. Despite knowing that his friend is in danger, Avery then waits a full day before leaving to meet up with Blood Ruth. This sequence of Avery driving his truck can be cut down to one page with all the internalization also on this single page. Here's a weird thing I noticed. In the middle of the page, we have this where Avery is talking about the coordinates that Gooding gave him. Then at the bottom of the page, we are back to Avery talking about his truck for some reason. Is what I'm proposing here meant to be the proper version of this page? Now for the next few pages, Avery's walk then long jog to the castle is unneeded. This scene could have just jumped from the previous page, that was a splash revealing the castle, to a single page that is a combination of the following two pages, and most of the internalization from the now removed panels can be split between the pages that are left. Back at Gooding's base, Avery was given what appeared to be a keycard by Gooding that Avery is instructed to give to Bloodruth. Later, when this object is in Bloodruth's possession, we learned that it wasn't a keycard, and this right here is the only explanation to what it might be. Was it supposed to be a gold bar to pay for her services? What I do know is that this prop was given focus as if it was to hold some importance only for its setup to lead to nothing. When Avery is talking to Bloodruth, he reminds us that he has a personal emergency that needs tending to, which makes his delay earlier in the story coming here even more baffling. Ponderous, man. Ponderous. If the situation that was going on with Avery's sister and niece was so important to him, the scene after Avery left Goodings should have gone like this, so Avery can get back to what should be the main plot of this story arc. It would also give the story a feeling of urgency. It's like Avery totally forgot about the phone call he had with Altona between Mrs. Willard showing up at his doorstep and this moment. Moving on to Avery and Bloodruth in the Hell Cave. We have a few pages of Avery fighting the monkey demons and, once Avery already has the demons wiped out, Bloodruth performs a magical blast for some unknown reason. It would have been more dramatically fitting for this moment to have happened earlier in the scene when Avery is being dogpiled on. And it would have been a better way to display Bloodruth's power if it was used to rescue Avery. Or maybe I'm just an idiot and this is the sole page of the book that needs to be read right to left like a manga. There's also something glaring about this sequence that doesn't make sense to me. Earlier in the story, Avery had trouble fighting two of these demons at once. And now it seems that he is able to fight multiple demons at once and defeat them with ease. This page here, what is this black blur? Is that supposed to be Bloodruth jumping in the way, or a magic shield? I can't say for sure because this is yet another thing that is not clarified. This exchange is the only thing we get as an explanation to that moment. And what does it even have to do with anything going on right now anyways? If anything, this exchange should have occurred right after Bloodruth's unnecessary magical explosion. I would just omit the two pages between these moments to help with the pacing of this already drawn out exploration of the cave. A little later, after Sam has been found by Bloodruth, this sequence here with all the blood platforms is yet another moment that can be streamlined. We didn't need a full page and a half of this. This is all that would be needed to show the same information but in a faster manner. And then shortly after, the book ended. And when I reached that back cover, I thanked the good, merciful Lord that the book had ended. There were so many times while reading this that I'd stop to count the pages left in this book and think, Great! I don't have much left to read! Only for this book to crawl on with its drawn-out pacing with pages and panels that seem to exist just to pad the page count. All the deletions to this story that I've suggested removes 25 pages, cutting the story down to just 84 pages of story. Does this change make ISOM number 2 a good story? No, I don't think so, but at least it improves the pacing, making it a much faster and less miserable read. Is there a point to all this? Let's find a point. I guess the point I'm trying to make with this is that just because you can make a story that's 109 pages, 
doesn't mean that you should. This issue was just a slow burn, and you're just too impatient to enjoy it. I disagree. A slow burn story still sees a protagonist dealing with conflict throughout the story. My favorite example of a slow burn story is the 1968 movie adaptation of Rosemary's Baby. Things start out pretty slow with this movie as we get to know Rosemary and her husband, Guy, when they move into a new apartment which is coincidentally the same building that John Lennon will be ventilated in front of in 1980. We meet Rosemary and Guy's weird and nosy neighbors, and this brunette, who Rosemary forms a lifelong friendship with. Lifelong for the brunette, that is. And we learn of Rosemary and Guy's desire to have a family. After what Rosemary believes to be a wet dream with old Nick, Rosemary finds herself pregnant. During the same time period, Guy's stagnant acting career suddenly takes off. Unexplained illness and sudden death befall people the couple know. We see Rosemary deal with difficulties in her pregnancy, and we see Rosemary begin to grow increasingly paranoid that her neighbors, doctor, and even her husband are all members of a devil-worshipping cult conspiring against her to take possession of her unborn child. All this leads to a climax that still haunts me every time I see this movie. This movie takes its time building up the characters and the situation, but something is always happening over the course of its 136 minute runtime. What we get out of Isom number 2 is Avery getting attacked and then talking to one person, talking to another person, talking to a third person, talking to person number 1 again, and then talking to a fourth person before finally ending up in one of the dullest and most stretched out action sequences I have ever seen. Now moving on to the major characters, starting with the new ones, Lincoln Usbio. He seems to be the good guy, wealthy industrialist type we see in superhero comics frequently. He seems to have a pre-existing rivalry with Darren and seems to genuinely care about his employees. He sounds like the god-tier Chad boss I would love to have. Outside of that, there's not really much to him for someone who is given as much focus as he is. Chad Run. All we learn about him is that he is a flatly characterized killing machine. The Monkey Demons. All we know about them is that they are from another dimension and seem to be harvesting people for some reason. We are given no hint as to what their motivations could be and what any of this has to do with Avery. We get this line where Bloodruth mentions she's defeated one of the Monkey Demons recently, and then it's made obvious that she has no interest in why they have shown up in our realm. This doesn't make much sense because if Bloodruth deemed them enough of a threat to be eliminated, you would think that she would already be trying to figure out why they are showing up. Gooding is a tech-based superhero for hire, making his motivation clear. His primary purpose is to spew exposition. Larry Shungite. He is an uncharacter, or a character who is in the story with no purpose but is given way too much focus. He clearly is not a legally distinct stand-in for Steve Austin, whose only purpose in a meaningless scene is to cut a promo where he turns heel in a scripted sport. Mrs. Willard. She is also an uncharacter. There is no reason at all for this character to exist. She shows up at Avery's place to express worry for her husband Sam, which as I have already mentioned is something Avery should already feel after it was made clear that Sam's location was unknown, and then faints in the next scene she appears in. Sydney Bloodruth. Part of her role in this story is the same as Gooding's, to give exposition. She is also there to hold Avery's hand, taking him exactly where he needs to go. She seems to use blood-based magic, like Scarlet from Mortal Kombat. I kind of wonder what type of an effect going through Shark Week has on her abilities. If that gold card Avery gave her was payment, I'm going to guess that her motivation is for profit, like Gooding. For our returning characters, we have Altona, who is only in this story to fear for her life. Darren. He is still a guy whose only character trait is that he is... I've come to notice that Darren seems to point a lot in every scene where he appeared in Isom number 1. This is a trend that has continued in this book. I'm guessing that he's supposed to be the Harrison Ford of the Ripaverse. It's finally been established in this story that he has managed to corrupt some high rollers, showing that he is someone who is to be feared in Flores Park. Cedric Gaucho. He is only here for a page to give a pep talk to Avery that I wonder why he didn't give when Avery first quit and handed over his suit. Alpha Core. And if we believe there's even a 1% chance that he is our enemy, we have to take it as an absolute certainty. 
he is not our enemy. And that's it. San Juan. He has been reduced to a cameo, and as I discussed earlier, he feels completely misused for the brief time he is in this story. Sally, also known as Yaira. Why is she even here? Sam Willard. He has been upgraded from uncharacter as he was in ISOM number one to MacGuffin in this issue. And finally, our protagonist, Avery Silman. As I said previously, Avery's reasoning for choosing to become ISOM again, a decision that should have been the climax of the previous issue, is still a complete mystery. As I mentioned earlier, I believe this issue would have given us a definite reason why he made that choice. But now I'm starting to believe that reason won't be revealed. I'm also surprised in this issue that we didn't see Avery using some Deus Ex Machina ability that we've never seen before. Well, maybe. Some folks might consider this high jump Avery makes during his fight in the Hell Cave of the Apes as him displaying a new ability. If you ask me, when a character is shown to have enough super strength that allows them to generate enough force where they can tackle someone through a brick wall, their ability to leap great distances is definitely a given. I'm sure we'll see Avery display a very clear new ability that's a plot convenience for his victory whenever he faces off against demonic Dr. Zaius here. The sooner he has exterminated, the better. Avery feels like a different character in ISOM 2 than what he did in ISOM number 1. But it's not in the way where a character changes where they've developed as a character. But there is some consistency as we see Avery be reluctant to help someone he personally knows in their time of need. Another consistency from ISOM number one is when Avery blindly runs into a situation like the hothead he is. I'm gonna open a file of whoop-ass on you! Avery's defining trait from the previous issue, his need to be respected, has been completely stripped from him in this issue. I was willing to give Eric July the benefit of the doubt that all of Avery's negative characteristics of being a selfish narcissist that I spoke of in my review for ISOM number one had a possibility of being addressed in this issue. I'll say though, I'm not surprised that did not happen, and I have no doubt at all that this will remain unaddressed. We have this moment right here where Avery gets mad over learning that Darren attacked Altona. This is a very understandable thing to get upset over. The thing about this moment is, if Avery is going to be mad at anybody, he should be mad at himself. Darren's attack on Altona probably wouldn't have happened if Avery didn't go on his rampage which escalated the initial situation and then go on a second rampage later. If you were here for my last ISOM review, you will know that I am very partial to Spider-Man. A lot of the bad things that happened in the life of Peter Parker and the people surrounding him tend to be Peter's fault, even if it was an unintended consequence. However, Spider-Man always takes the L and admits that these problems are caused by his own hand. I doubt we'll see Avery come to this same conclusion, mainly because I don't think that Eric July realizes that this is a situation where Avery is the one at fault. During his journey through this issue, Avery doesn't have to earn anything. He goes one place where he is told where to go in a scene of exposition that goes on for way too long. Then Avery goes to that location, talks to Blood Ruth who says the same thing Gooding did about the monsters being interdimensional, and then Avery is taken to the Hell Cave by Blood Ruth. All of the heavy lifting in this story is done by someone else which completely voids the story of any drama. Heck, Blood Ruth is the one responsible for locating and rescuing Sam in the cave. Now, hear me out on something for a little bit. What if in Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones showed up at Marion Ravenwood's bar and she just handed over the headpiece of the Staff of Raw, which I'll just refer to as the medallion from here on out for brevity's sake, which Indy needed with no fuss and Marion chose to tag along on his adventure for no reason. Then when Indy and Marion arrived in Egypt, the first thing Sala said to them was, Indy, my friend, I have translated the symbols on the medallion you described in your letter. I discovered the Well of Souls and I've recovered the Ark for you. I have already chartered a boat to get both you and the Ark out of Egypt. And then the final act of Raiders goes on as we all know it, ending with the Nazis being slaughtered by the wrath of the Good Lord. That'd be a pretty lame action-adventure movie, wouldn't it? So why should that be acceptable for an action-adventure superhero comic? But thank the Good Lord that wasn't the case with Raiders. Indy always got the next clue that got him closer to discovering the Ark of the Covenant, but he had to go through conflict to obtain it. Marion was reluctant to give her medallion to Indy, which gave us that great shootout in the bar while it burns down where Indy saves Marion and her medallion from some hired Nazi stooges. We then get that chase through the streets of Cairo where Indy has to fight off more Nazi stooges who are trying to stop Indy in his quest to recover the Ark. 
after Indy and Sala then speak to a man who translates the marking on the medallion, which gives the location to the Well of Souls, which is where the Ark lies. Indy and Sala recover the Ark, and they lose possession immediately to the Nazis. Indy and Marion are sealed in the Well of Souls, but manage to escape, and then we get a pair of back-to-back -back action sequences featuring a fight at an airport, and a chase scene before Indy is back in possession of the Ark until the final act of the movie. Seeing a character deal with conflict hooks our attention and creates tension and suspense for what will happen next. We love seeing a character overcome an obstacle because it gives us our own vicarious subconscious feeling of accomplishment. In other words, we like to watch our heroes succeed because in a parasocial way, we also succeed. It's no different than the parasocial relationship that sports fans have to their favorite teams and the pride fans feel when their team wins despite the fans themselves not having participated in the game. That might not be a good comparison though. I've never heard of a movie that was so good that audiences had a celebratory riot after watching it. There are even issues with the formatting of this book. This page here near the end. I've never seen such a random placement for the acknowledgements in a book before. Its current placement during the final scene interrupts the flow of the story. Which we all know is nothing new in what we've seen so far out of the Isom books. This page should be the last page of the book, or it could have been part of the introduction. On the very next page, we have this blurb teasing the conclusion of the story arc in the next issue. Then the scene goes on for two more pages. The teaser blurb should be here on the bottom of the last story page. Just like with every other serialized comic I have read in my 34 years of existence. Maybe these two pages are meant to be a teaser for the next issue, but they fit so well with what we are already reading that it is hard to tell for sure. It just seems to me as if the formatting of this book was approved by someone who is incompetent. There's also a good deal of grammatical and spelling errors in this book. Hypocrisy! You admitted earlier that you made a mistake in your first ISOM video. You don't have the right to call Eric out. Where is the law that says I can't call someone out just because I made a mistake too? I'll be the first to admit that I'm far from the smartest person to exist, and I've put out plenty of tweets with errors because I rarely take the time to proofread what I post. There's also a major difference between my mistakes and Eric July's mistakes. I'm not running a company and I'm not releasing a product with multiple mistakes in it to the market for purchase. Eric has made multiple grammatical and spelling mistakes over the course of two expensive books. The mistakes he's made, the Ripa clan would no doubt rag on bigger companies endlessly if they saw the same thing in one of their current titles. Heck, I'd join in with them. If anyone out there is going to defend this type of behavior, then it really speaks volumes about how little you really care about the quality of your entertainment. Eric's already apologized for that, so stop it! I am well aware, but it is something that should have never happened. And an apology doesn't mean it never happened, nor does it make it immune from mockery. And all of you out there are welcome to mock me for my mistakes. I'll even join in with it. I ain't got no learning. These mistakes probably wouldn't have happened if Eric had himself a good story editor. Eric already has two editors. He doesn't need a third. Yes, Eric has two copy editors. Copy editors just proofread for spelling and grammar issues. I highly doubt that they had any input in this product outside of spelling and grammar notes in the scripting phase. A story editor is someone who supervises the production of a book from start to finish and checks for any problems that need correction before moving on to the next step of production. I have no doubt that Eric is acting as the story editor himself on top of writing, running his business, and making his YouTube videos. He probably has too many irons in the fire and should hire some outside help to be his story editor to catch issues Eric might not see himself. I can actually sympathize a little because it's easy for someone to overlook a mistake in their own work if they know what they are trying to accomplish. This is why you should have as many eyes as possible on something that is meant to turn a profit to make it the best quality product you can. Now on to the pricing. I saw number 2 cost me 35 shekels plus an additional 850 for shipping, bringing that final cost to 4350. The book itself is better quality this time around, like I saw number 1. I saw number two has the same standard glossy pages trade paperbacks tend to have. But this time around, it also has the standard glossy cover trades normally have, as opposed to the rough feeling matte cover of the previous book. Like I saw number one, 
there is no officially released digital version of this book. While I am a huge supporter of physical media, I think that it is extremely foolish of any company to not release digital versions of their media because that's just the direction the world has been going in the past several years. I personally think this would have been a wise move for Ripaverse Publishing, because there are fans who would still buy all four cover variants to leave unread as collector's items and would use the digital copy as their reader. Seems to me like money is just being thrown out the window by not having a digital version of either ISOM book available for purchase. And once again, I'd feel less frustrated with myself about the money I spent on this if there were a cheaper digital option available. I purchased a hardcover copy of The Crow around the same time as I saw number one. That book is 272 pages long and has a price of $28 brand new after shipping and taxes. Both ISOM books together have a combined 191 story pages, and both books together have cost me an embarrassingly whopping $86 total. Just based on the price to page comparison between both ISOM books and The Crow, which sounds like the best bang for your buck to you? Nonetheless, there is a link to the Riververse website in the description for anyone who wishes to buy their own copy of ISOM number 2. The nonsense song Bird Feathers and Pleather by Jaywalk tells a more intriguing story than what I have seen out of ISOM so far. I'll commend the main plot this issue falls actually having a complete plot structure, but despite that stated improvement, I saw number two is still too poorly written and has pacing too frustratingly slow for me to recommend it to anyone. Overall, I'll say this issue is on par with the previous one, so I will give I saw number two a one out of five. If you want to read a good story about a street level superhero that has some heart to it, I recommend the first volume of Kick Ass, written by Mark Millar and with art by John Romita Jr. If you've only watched the movie, give the comic a read. The comic is a different animal. Even though I have very little hope that it'll do anything to impress me based on what I've seen so far, I do plan on reading and reviewing I Psalm number 3 just to finish out this story arc. Beyond that, I'm very reluctant to continue on with this series. Even if I did think what we've seen so far was good, I would probably make the same choice because this series just cost way too much per book for me to want to continue on with it. I will say I am legitimately interested in reading Alpha Core, but that's solely because of the team attached to it. However, I'm in no rush to read and review that book if it ends up having another final price of at least $40 like the preceding books from the Ripaverse. But if anyone out there is willing to give me a good deal on a secondhand copy after they're done with it, shoot me a DM on one of my socials. Also, don't forget to shoot me a message if you have a movie or comic book project of your own you want me to give a review of. Speaking of social media, I invite everyone out there to give me a follow on Twitter and Letterboxd. As for the future of this channel, my work and personal life permitting, I'm going to try my best to have at least one video out a month. I'm going to try to bounce back and forth between movies and comics going forward. So if any of you out there are interested in what's to come and hearing more of my idiotic ramblings, go ahead and subscribe and ring the little bell to be notified of new releases. Also, feel free to like and share this video if you enjoy what I'm doing and want to help this channel grow. In closing, I encourage all of you out there to go out and develop your own opinions, and not just blindly follow some chosen group or my word alone. When it comes to entertainment, just because someone shares an opinion you don't agree with does not mean that they are attacking you. If you find yourself feeling that way, then maybe you should take some time to re-examine your life. After all, the realm of fantasy isn't real, so it's never worth having a meltdown over just because somebody disagrees with you. I'm Jess Zilla, and this has been my moronic opinion. Thank you for your time.